All right. So um, I'm going to talk about how to do a workload aware or workload driven uh, memory registration. Um, this talk is mainly for the kernel consumers today, uh, primarily for um, for um, it, it, it's a Linux centric, but could be extended to the other other OSCs as well. Um, all the groundwork is done for the Linux, um, primarily for ISR, SRP, uh, NFS, RDM, and any other ULPs that you would like to extend into the into the kernel space. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'm going to talk. Um, it's open where if we see a value in extending some of these semantics through a uh, through an extended works for the user applications, then that's an open platform for us to do it. Uh, it, it uh, um, I'd be happy to discuss as part of OFP um, or OFI. I'm not sure at this stage, but I see it as a as a verb extension so far because they are very minimal set of changes. Some of them are optional features. Uh, so what we see today is. Uh, there is increasing demand or deployments for the distributed storage which is coming up instead of um, vertical units where um, petabytes of storage being into a same same unit and the the, the storage is, is spread across uh, multiple nodes and each of those nodes gets added probably every week or every month or so instead of building the whole data center at, at one shot uh, this is an incremental model, and and by doing that, the the storage capacity keep increasing, and so the connectivity to each of the nodes needs to be done at at a um, dynamically as we go on. Uh, this applies to all distributed file systems who who are spread across uh, uh, across the the storage nodes. At the same time. Uh, we see this with the block storage devices, and as we move on to probably eraser codes or or, or a software rate based uh, deployments where each of the disk is being exposed, or probably NVMe or fabrics where we see each of the disk is being exposed to the host who is uh, striping out the data to multiple of disks or um, replicating it or, or, or storing them instead of uh, instead of having everything on the on the storage node. So. Uh, uh, for some of these modes, um, we need a dynamic scheme to, to register an MR. Um, what we see today is uh, SRP initiator creates 128 memory regions, the, the fast memory regions to uh, to perform the IOs. ISR to 113 and NFSRDMA among highest to, to use 2178. I think there are recent patches to to bring this number down. I'm not sure. Chuck uh, ensured me that some of these numbers are getting lower now. Um, so this works fine in some of the some of the workloads. But what we see is that uh, as you scale number of connections, where you have, might have one-to-one -one connection to, to disk to, uh, to a block storage, your, the order of magnitude for one block device to the number of MRs is, is an order of hundreds that we can we can make use of. None of these schemes uh, make use of the feature, uh, whether it's an SSD or a hybrid storage or or a, uh, or a rotating disk that is that is behind the uh, there in the storage. None of them consider the sport sport speed, whether it's a logically 40 Gbps or 10 Gbps or two years later 25 Gbps, and this is just a sweet spot that we picked up today to uh, to make it work. And what we believe is that the finding out the sp sweet spot should be the job of the software, and not something um, hard coded value at the runtime. Uh, <coughs> Or, or at least at the connection establishment time. So, uh, what we would like to see is memory registration happening. Uh, the registration and deregistration should be happening dynamically when we are doing this. When we see some of the traffic patterns, largely we can categorize into four different traffic patterns for the block storage I/O. Um, 
one is a sustained traffic that you are running from the client to the uh, client to the server or uh, initiator to target at, at a constant rate. Those are high ability devices uh, doing the replica copies. Uh, that's the one that you see in your blue and red, uh, blue and um, yellow here, where you have small dip in, in the traffic, but otherwise it runs. Then you have certain VMs which are deployed with just some of the bus traffic for a short period of time and it dies out. And it continues for him at every regular interval. And some of the VMs which will do the work uh, based on the time could uh, um, in, a, in, in 24 hours of time, uh, which is uh, probably for a very short duration, but they are still exposed through an RDMA. Now, how do we have a scalability of the block storage to achieve all this uh, workload without compromising um, the balance between the number of connections or number of shares that we can do with the number of MRs? So what we have today is, is a static allocation in all the ULPs. Um, all the ULPs allocate a small number of memory regions at the start of it. and uh, it still works because whenever we have the burst I.O., we have the memory regions available, uh, whether we are using it or not using it. Uh, even if you have a sustained I.O., we will still have the memory regions available. One of uh, uh, yesterday mentioned about the long range Rocky and the limitation of the FMR, where we can't scale probably number of M FMRs beyond a certain point. And when that comes in, uh, we would like to be able to scale those many number of MRs going forward instead of a static scheme. So you can have more number of outstanding IOs on the wire because you have the more MRs available now. And how to do it is a, is a simple extension. Skip that. Um, what we propose uh, is again an extension. Needless to say, it's going to be open source and we would like to talk to IBTA as well for making these minor changes and obviously the the verb extension for these. What we want is uh, when we create a memory region, it does not need to bind to a PD. It should be just bound to a device. We still want the security. We still want one connection not to access the other MR. And how do we do it is the MR should be bound to a PD when that particular MR is being uh, deployed. And when the first memory region registration happens, that's the time when you bound that MR. So if I look at the IB, IB spec and translate it to that, the same state diagram here, when we allocate a key or when we create a FRMR region, it's in a free state, not bound to a PD. We make a fast registration call. It moves to an valid state, and that's where the adapter binds that region to a PD so that any operations that happens after this, uh, it could be validated. And when we are in the NIO phase, all the operations are going on, and then from the remote side, send with invalidate comes, or the local system does the local invalidate. The MR gets detached from the PD, and it goes back into the free state. Once we have this key, then this MR is portable across any number of connections that we have. Without destroying the MR, we can repurpose it. So usually the MR registration and deregistration call, which involves the, the, the flushing of the cache and accessing the MR um, within the adapter. And so therefore, uh, all of the uh, usually a slow path operation compared to the regular send read writes is avoided because now you can deploy these MRs dynamically across multiple connections. Um, is it secure? Yes. Most of the operating systems does not deal an MR L key to reference the memory region. If, um, there is always a handle or a memory region object that they work upon while performing the fast registration or local invalidate or send with invalidate. And so therefore, um, at an OS level, we don't really need to deal with an L key. L key is just, just a 24-bit handle, uh, while the MR handle at an OS level is, is really your 
pointer that you, uh, it's an IBMR uh, structure that you work upon. That's where, which is get bounced to a Q pair when we do a fast memory registration. Can we destroy the PD when, the, when this MR is created? Yes, it can be destroyed. It's not yet bound, but we usually don't do it until we destroy the Q pair. So PD cannot be destroyed if the Q pair is still active. Um, does it work from the VM and SRIV? Yes, because every MR that's been created uh, in the previous stage uh, is created for that PCI function. And so therefore, one VF cannot access the other VF as far as uh, that, that particular MRL key is concerned. So it inherits the PD from the QP of this post to That's right. So the second part of this scheme is pooling the MRs. Um, so if we take an ICER example, um, we have 113 uh, memory regions belonging to one connection. If the number of requests are more, we have to live with 113. If they are less, we are still dedicated those which cannot be used to the other Q pairs. So the scheme of the pooling MR here is a very typical standard, like similar to an Intel CPU. We have an L1 cache, which is per connection cache of in-memory regions. Uh, there's an L2 cache, and there's a global pool. The global pool has got hundreds of MRs, which can be created or destroyed dynamically. The pooling layer finds out, depending on the workload, do I need to add more memory regions, or I need to release them so that the other ULP in the system can make use of it? L2 cache bucket is nothing different. It's it, it's a it's a cache layer of the global pool. Whenever these memory regions are created or the connections are created, they are bound to a particular bucket. Um, the bucket which has the least number of it's it's an round robin fashion at present, where whichever bucket has the least number of MR in use, the new connections is put into that bucket. And so uh, when they don't find the entry into their own L1 cache, they come and uh, fetch the entry from their L2 cache. L1 cache is a connection, it's a, it's a lockless. It enjoys the, all the locks of the ULP that he has defined. And so the performance is not affected at all when he is using from the L1 cache. The entries into L1 cache is a static that they create, uh, it could still do 113, um, and it would never reference an L2 cache or, or a global pool. Uh, when the scalability comes in to access those block storage devices, the pooling layer is smart enough who will start stealing the entries from the L1 and L2 cache, whichever is unused. Uh, So at present, there are four to eight buckets per pool. Uh, these pools are per ULP. So SRP can have one pool, NFS RDMA can have the other, and uh, ISA can have the third pool. And these buckets could be per CPU. Uh, we are yet to do their performance tests for uh, on how to scale with CPUs. So um, at present, there are static four to eight buckets per pool, and um, the least used bucket is assigned. The L2 buckets primarily serves the purpose of avoiding all the contentions to, to access to the global pool by uh, hundreds of connections. So uh, the last point added to the L2 cache buckets if the bucket has space. Uh, so um, these MRs are created and used from the L1 or L2 cache. Now when do we put back those into an L2 cache or, or an L1 cache. So it's straightforward. If you have taken from the L1 cache, you put it back into an L1 cache. If you have taken from the global pool, then there's a choice. You can put it in an L2 cache or you can put it in a global cache, depending on the size that that's left into an L2 cache. So it's, it's available, then it can be used from the L2. Otherwise, uh, if the bucket is full, then put it into a global cache. Um, there is little difference to them on how do we use it. Um, 
So th this is a typical flow with the send with invalidate, which is a straightforward, where you have a block write happening. You fetch an entry from the MR pool. It, it would be lockless if you are if you if you are a number of outstanding IOs from the L1. Um, you issue an FRMR request on the wire. Uh, perform an RDMS send, goes through a fabric to the storage node, and then the storage node performs the data operation, uh, RDMA read or write for the I.O. And then it would do a send with invalidate. That's the time when you pull, then you put the entry back into a MR pool after uh, when you receive a completion for the send with invalidate. Um, the local invalidate brings little interesting aspect. So send with invalidate erases the PD from the MR? That's right. The invalidate operation uh, detaches the MR from the PD. But even the remote invalidate does that. Uh, the processing <coughs> requires a signal to this. Well, but I mean, yeah. I don't so do you mean the local invalidate? The local invalidate I see will work straightforward. But a remote invalidate still requires the local provider. You can send an interrupt to get the CPU going mm -hmm. to log that PD invalidation. It's more than a hardware invalidation. It's also a state change of the MR right. um, uh, with respect to its PD membership. So um, help me to understand. So send with invalidate and local invalidate from the adapter point of view is treated the same way. Right, it's fine with the adapter. That's right. But there's an additional implication on the software there above the adapter. That's right. When you remove that PD. Right, so when the. You have to send the interrupt, that's my point. Right, so send with invalid. Right, so send with invalidate always. We always have a receive completion. So send with invalidate will always translate into a receive completion. And so. When we receive that completion, there would be an interrupt right at that moment or later. After that stage, we will uh, we will be able to put the MR back into the into the MR pool. Yeah, okay. uh, you erase the PD, it's ready to go back. That's right. Erase the PD, detach the MR from the PD. Right? The PD still exists. The PD apart. The PD still exists. The MR still exists. They've just been dissociated. They are just detached. That's right. Exactly. The local invalidate is a is an interesting case. When you issue a local invalidate, you have to get the completion for that CQ to come back. Otherwise, uh, the local invalidate occurs on that Q pair. You don't know whether it's complete or net, not yet. And if the local invalidate is in progress, and if you add your memory region back to the pool, just because you have issued the local invalidate. It's likely to con happen into a race condition where the other QP picks up that MR, starts using it, and uh, depending on when that stage has happened, there'll be a there'll be an issue. So, um, when we do an inv a lo a local invalidate, uh, you can put that entry back into an L1 cache to make use of it because now when you issue the uh, IOs, he can still consume it from the L1 cache because all the operations are in order on a given Q pair. But you cannot put back those entries into an L2 cache or, or a global pool. So, uh, the, 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 yeah, go ahead. Calling it a cache, is it really just different levels of pooling of the variable MRs, variable MRs? Yeah, it's just, a, it's just a very thin software cache layer. But as he points out, they could be in a different state. They could be not yet invalidated in pool one, but they yeah. have to be fully invalidated to go into pool two. Okay, so I'm just asking about the use of the word cash versus pool. To me, it's just a, a different types of pools. That's right. It's just a bucket. So, okay. Yeah. So L1 cash is, is a per connection cache. So you don't need to take a lock. Just pick the entry from the pool. Uh, sorry, just pick the entry from the L1 cache. It's a pool of connections available, like a pool of cache, a pool of MRs available to that connection. That's right. Okay. All right. right. So right now it's static and we're moving to a dynamic workload scenario. And Is this like a K1 cache? It's not. Uh, it's not like a K1 cache. Probably, yeah. Um, I'm not sure, fully sure of uh, how many labels do, do they create? No, it's more like a slab cache where it can only be used for a specific purpose. Right. 
one slab is sitting. Right, but it can move from one slab to the other slab. There's certain restrictions based on its state. That's right. So it, that restriction comes home from the local invalidate operation. And the ordering, as you point out, I mean, it's really subtle. It's, a, it's an important point. It's pretty important point that, that, that the ULP has to take care that when he's adding an entry to an L1 cache, he's free to use. Uh, the same MR, and um, when we put it into a global pool, then um, it can be it can be added only at, at that stage when the completion arrives. Uh, so this I've already talked. Um, so how does it translates to to the APIs? Um, they're fairly straightforward. Uh, the query device is extended. I haven't shown it here, but the query device says whether I'll support uh, PD less MR or not. This um, whether whether we need a PD when we create an MR or not. The the second feature is uh, when we create an FMR FRMR pool, we pass a PD ID uh, to indicate that um, all the MRs create for this PD, and this is an optional. So. Those ULPs who wants to have multiple connection sharing the same PD, then it would just go into this mode where they pass a PD and all the MRs are bound to that PD. In the other mode where you want to share the MRs across multiple PDs, then you just pass null there and all the MRs are created within that pool is, is not bound to a PD. Uh, so those are the APIs for the ULP. Uh, the other APIs that uh, the ULP needs to use, uh, that every ULP does today, which are consolidated into this single layer, is uh, a, a pool user saying, I am one of the connection, uh, I am the pool user. Uh, I decide whether I want to use it across two Q pairs or single Q pair, but um, it, it informs the pooling layer so that the pool layer can attach it to a particular bucket uh, where to put this consumer to. So the pool you create user, uh, create pool user and uh, destroy FRMR pool user uh, to, to bind it to it. And finally, the runtime APIs are the, the non blocking APIs. You ask for MR and you put an MR back when you get it, um, when you get the completions. Uh, <coughs> there are knobs for the, for the ULP where they believe that they need to add more MRs because the MRs are not. Uh, their MRs are not sufficient enough, then the, then the ULP layer could also add the MRs to this pool. But you would like to avoid that and keep that logic within the pooling layer to, to add, or receive, uh, add or remove the entries from the pool. Uh, Arthur, sure. Do you provide a shrinker interface to the pool? A uh, shrink interface? A shrinker? Uh, that's right. So um, right now the interface is not at the kernel level, but it is at the pool level. So the, the pool runs a thread in a background at, a, at every millisecond or something where he monitors the threshold <coughs> saying my, my threshold is 32 or 64 MRs. If I go, if the number of free MRs are going below this level, then it pops up and creates the more MRs. And at the same time, he sees that um, if the MRs are not being used for these connections, then it would free up those MRs in chunk of block. Not uh, thousands of MRs are not freed at one time. Uh, they are freed in in small chunk of uh, 32 to 64, so that any bursty traffic that comes in can still get those MRs uh, to address those needs. So a simple a simple uh, test that we did was. Uh, just pick up or reduce the number of memory regions for on an adapter to, to 2,000. And what we see is a, almost a three times scale uh, with the same number of MRs. We are yet to do the performance test, but uh, we are pretty sure that until all the MRs are from the L1 cache, there would be no hit. And when the MRs are picked up by the pooling layer, when the scale increases, um, the MRs from the L1 cache uh, is going to go back to the uh, uh, L2 cache or the global pool. Uh, how does this translate to the user applications? Uh, I'm running out of time. I'll just take two to three minutes uh, and not block you for the lunch. Um, 
how does it translates to to the user extensions uh, we can dynamically bind the mrs to the pd uh, without involving the registration and deregistration part so you create bunch of mrs uh, the memory is pinned but once a connection is died you don't need to call a deregister you can involve this special work requests to to bind that mr to the other connection and those connections still can work making use of the same pin memory and it does not needs to touch any of the the kernel component for that the this puts up a hole uh, from the spec perspective that uh, the scope of those mrs for the adapter within the u context so if the mr from one u context wants to access the mr of the other u context then the adapter would block it but if the mr from the one u from one u context with the two pds who is trying to bind the mr across the two uh that something is not there yet and so that would be allowed by the adapter uh, that's the role of the the application to take care not to bind it but if needed that could be extended but at present that it's not there yet so that's the rebind rule you can you can post it without having it validated <coughs> if the pd matches if the pd does not match you're mm -hmm. prevented from reposting right is that right uh so uh, let me take an example so we create a q pair uh say two q pairs two pds and one u context well, that's not necessarily true you could assign the same pd to both pds yes in that case it's fine the the, um, the issues arise but it's important normally you can't rebind uh 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 right you have to invalidate it before you bind that that's right right so but you're saying there are exceptions in this case where you can rebind that's right and the and the exception is if the pd matches if the pd matches there's no need to rebind it from from the user's application board you might want to assign it a new region so it's it's a re-registration then right but that's the point you have to unregister you can't re-register yeah. a registered region you have to you have to invalidate it first that's right so um uh, we have to invalidate the memory region if it is a uh, different pd right. i i think there's an you're, you're you're drawing a short circuit in the state diagram of an mr which might be really interesting Yeah. I'm just curious what so so all right. Um uh, what's work in progress uh the fairness among the connections to meet the SLA requirements is is something that we are uh, we need to tune further where we say that um, one long range uh, rocky connection does not end up using all the 2 KMRs or uh, one slow SSD one slow um hard drive is not using up all the mrs and we need to bring this fairness level to find out um how to do it so that's a problem uh it is an upper layer problem but uh, i'm trying to map the c group um, block io um characteristics where we say that i'm i'm reducing the block uh, rates and so since the rate of this block io device is being reduced and therefore let me bring down the number of mrs for this right so we we pull it back into the pool for that uh that's all i have for for this work sure good that's good what else you wrote that to relate to something that the last year from one so it so for i i see your point and it makes a lot of sense in the vm case where you can delay the pinning uh at an io time and tcp ip is beautiful in that sense um what we are trying to address here is um for the block io the memory is already pinned the io is really happening at this stage and when the io is happening we need a memory region to make uh, to service that io uh, 
and so therefore this particular proposal addresses the need to service those IOs in an effective way, uh, not to fail the connections or. Um, this is on the client. This is on the initiator. That's right. Whereas on demand, search the data. You know, the target. Yeah, I would like to talk this to. Is good for servers. This is good for clients. That's right. I'd like to talk to you offline for, for server side to make use of MRs, which some of the OS does not do. But uh, let's talk it offline. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, one last question. Okay. Uh, one question. Do you plan, uh, probably, maybe a good question. Do you plan, uh, like, for the scenario you are buying? Uh, where your connection is broke, not mm -hmm. just some of them die, some of them get created. Just uh, let's say you are alone on the network, you create those volumes, get started, and then uh, eventually, like with TCP IP, you need to correlate with the kernel uh, to check how much memory you can, uh, you can get. And, uh, mm -hmm. Right, like uh, I receive window, TCP IP, right? Do you plan to do that, or it's already happened? So it's pretty much handled at a transport layer right now. Uh, for for the block I/O, it's really the I/O or the block subsystem, block subsystem that drives how many I/Os to issue at a given point and how many memory it has already available. So the block layer does the QoS for for all the block I/Os, and that would translates to how many how much amount of memory pinning can be done. Um, did I answer your question? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks all.